Joining us this evening, I am Rebecca Sharouf, Director of Alumni and Family Philanthropic Engagement here at Eastern, and this is our third online event that we've done for our alumni, and we're very excited to have all of you here taking a look at um, one topic that I think that is hitting a lot of our Eastern community, both students, alumni, and parents. And that's dealing with education and teaching and learning right now. So just to let everyone know, we are recording this webinar. It's going to be uploaded to YouTube and shared with everyone afterwards. So you can watch it again at your leisure or share with anyone who is unable to make it. And we'll take questions through the question and answer box as we're going through the discussion. So feel free to uh, chime in with anything that you're interested in learning. And without further ado, I'll give it over to uh, our moderators, Janine Dunn and Julie Cook. Thank you Great. both again for doing this this evening and the rest of our panelists. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. We're really looking forward to having a great discussion tonight. Um, again, my name is Janine Dunn, and just to give you a little background on myself, um, I am an instructor in the College of Education here at Eastern University. Um, I teach some methods classes on how to teach math, science, and health. Um, and I guess I should mention that I, I am an alum in a way myself here with Eastern. I've received my principal certification through Eastern and also obtained uh, instructional coaching endorsement. And I believe that, you know, we should practice what we preach while we are while we're in the field of education. So I do still work full time as a middle school teacher at Soderton Charter School Collaborative, which is a small, fully inclusive uh, K to eight public charter school. And um, just a little side note that it's ranked one of the best schools in the state. You can check it out on niche.com niche <laughs> if you're interested. Um, part of our mission uh, there is to, you know, incorporate parent and community partnerships, hands-on learning and individualization, um, which actually really complements our partnership with Eastern University. Um, interestingly enough, we have at least 10 out of our 30 full-time teachers that are um, either Eastern University alumni or have taken some courses through Eastern at some point. Um, so I think that just that alone, that there is a great connection between Eastern um, and working with different schools out and around uh, the area. And on that note, I would like to introduce you to uh, my co-host tonight, um, Julie Cook, who is also another instructor here at Eastern University. And she's also one of my teaching partners at Soderton Charter School. Julie. Hello, I'm Julie Cook. Um, as Janine said, I am also an instructor at Eastern. Um, I teach methods courses, as does Janine. I teach social studies and art or social studies and English language arts to undergraduate and graduate students. I'm also an alum of uh, Eastern University's Greater Philadelphia Instructional Coaching Endorsement Program. Um, and by day, I am Janine and Brandon Reichert's co-teacher at the Satterton Charter School Collaborative here in Montgomery County. Um, so I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to introduce Brandon. Hello, teaching partner. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me. I am Brandon Reichert. I graduated from Eastern in 2015. I did my undergrad studies there. I graduated with a major in middle level education, so specifically grades four through eight, uh, with a con uh, concentration in math and science. I currently teach with Janine and Julie at Saturn Charter School here in Satterton, uh, where I preferably, you know, teach seventh and eighth grade uh, math and science specifically. All right, and Abby, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Abby Buckley. I'm a rising senior at Eastern University, and I'm studying early childhood education with a certification in special ed. Um, I've actually had the privilege of having Janine Dunn as one of my professors, and she's pretty awesome. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're pretty awesome too, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kareen. Did I say that right? <laughs> yes, yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Kareen Kupstis. I'm in the post-baccalaureate program working on um, secondary education certification in math. And um, so I also am a student of um, Janine's and really enjoyed her class on how to teach math, science, and health and um, have a, a bachelor's degree in, in chemical engineering. That's awesome. All right, and then last but not least, we have Ben. Hi, I'm Ben Krenzman. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. I kind of uh, found, I, I went to Bucknell University. I graduated in uh, 2003 with a degree in computer science. 
played baseball there and I did a lot of uh, baseball coaching. Uh, I did 11 years in college and I came to Eastern to get my graduate degree. I got a master's in organizational leadership and I enjoyed myself here so much, I decided to work here. So I've been working as a, the associate director of admissions at Eastern and uh, I'm uh, taking classes uh, towards a mid-level math certification as well. Awesome. Well, it really is wonderful to have you all here and I greatly appreciate you taking the time to discuss teaching and learning in these changing times. Um, we have a great panel, you know, made up of alumni, um, undergrads, grad students, and, and parents. So I think it should make for a really great discussion. Um, these are certainly unprecedented times, and the field of education has definitely felt the impact. There are, there are pros and cons, right, to the recent changes that have taken place, and I'm really wondering how students, teachers, and parents have experienced these changes. Um, I know, Julie, maybe you can tell us, you know, how your role as an instructor has impacted, like what sort of transitions did you end up having to make? Was it easy? Was it hard? Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, luckily, I did have some experience teaching um, at the college level online, um, but not all of our students uh, did have that prior experience um, in their tool belt there. But we were able to move some things around, shift a bit. Um, but our students, I think, were very resilient and up for the challenge. Um, although I think we were able to stay true to the mission of the course, I was glad to first have had that time to build relationships first, um, which I think is a hallmark of education at, at Eastern University's program. Um, and I am sad for them, um, for seniors who are missing out on those traditions and for those seasons on the sports fields that were canceled. Um, so there's real mourning for the loss of that personal connection. Uh, but there's also been opportunities, I think, to think about how this experience uh, will inform their practice in the future. Um, I definitely think that's been true at the K to 12 level for myself. Um, so Brandon, maybe you can share your thoughts. Um, what was it like when we had to whip up emergency school in a few days? Yeah, so, uh, you know, just starting with the transition, I think we, you know, we had our, our eye kind of on the news, kind of understanding what could possibly be coming down the pipeline, uh, realizing that our kids having been involved in the Google Classroom feel, uh, both from all the way really through K through eight, had a feeling of understanding that they could use some tech at home if necessary, things like that. I would say the biggest transition was understanding that, you know, internet's an issue, technology can be an issue depending on if they have Chromebook availability or other forms of, you know, computer atmosphere. Uh, so the biggest form for us was certainly making sure that each kid was taken care of. And once we, we were able to you know, certify that each kid was able to take a one, one to one Chromebook with us being at the Saturn charter school, we're smaller, we're a little bit more nimble, flexible. Uh, we were able to make that work. So that was a big, big plus as we moved towards uh, a virtual classroom feel. Uh, and then, you know, the, the typical everyday stuff, understanding that kids you have other things at home, trying to understand scheduling, trying to figure out can kids be available, can kids work on their own, can they be responsible for their own, all the way from kindergarten to eighth grade. Primarily, we work with, I work with seventh and eighth graders. Our kids are, are very tech savvy, very fluent online, have the ability to sign in. We had practiced some Google, uh, some Zoom meeting kind of hookups, if you will, before school had let out. We were lucky enough that we had a, an extra half hour before we found out that school was going to be closed for the foreseeable future. So we got ahead of it a little bit there. Um, the biggest thing I would say, you know, for us transition wise was we didn't have the answers. Every day something new popped up every day. We were trying to understand from both the, the, the kid perspective, the parent perspective, what can we do? How can we facilitate learning in a different atmosphere? Um, and it, it was tough. It, it was draining at, at some times and, and it still is, but we certainly, you know, cultivated and, and were able to take our curriculum and integrate it and make it virtual. Uh, we did a lot of front loading through HyperDocs, which we'll talk about probably later on. Um, and our kids have, have, have responded positively. And, and we think we're still reaching you know, all, if not hopefully most kids. You know, it, it can be tough daily. But, but I would say overall, it wasn't an easy transition. Continue, continues to be difficult on the day to day. But, you know, as teachers, our profession is to, to do the best we can for our kids. And I think we're, we're following through on that. So, Yeah, I would say there was, there was no 
you know, <laughs> no cookie cutter curriculum here to, you know, <laughs> pick up and, and give out, you know, and get teachers going with it. Um, it really was like fly by the seat of your pants and figure it out and what's going to work best for your students in that particular situation. I think every school was really um, doing things differently because they had to, right? Um, so that was interesting. Um, hey, hey Ab Yes. Oh, sorry. I hate to interrupt, but I just want to um, help with a little tech questions. Sure. Um, everyone's asking about how to see more of the panelists. So if everyone has their little video of the speaker, there's options that say show small active speaker video, show mm -hmm. thumbnail, and also show grid view. So if everyone chooses the grid view, they should be able to see all the panelists and make the video a little wider. So I just wanna make sure everyone can see your faces even when you're not talking. And we also had a question come in. Mm -hmm. That was, hold on. Um, one of our guests said that their school uses Google Classroom. Were there any other resources that you suggest? Yes, and actually we're gonna, um, when we get towards the, the end, one of our last questions is like, what tech tools are, are helpful and supportive? So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later on. So if we, if we don't answer your question, then just let us know and we'll, we'll come back to it. But yeah, Perfect. Any, anybody else for right now? Are we good? <laughs> no, we're good, that was it. <laughs> All right, great, thanks. All right, so let's, let's go back to Abby real quick. So Abby, you're an undergrad. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the transition was like for you? you I know you were taking classes actually on campus at the time um, yes. at Eastern. Yes, I was taking classes on campus and it was pretty abrupt um, when we got the news that we weren't gonna be um, taking classes on campus anymore and everything was moved online. Um, and I am a very scheduled type A person. So it was really tough for me to lose that foundational day-to-day -day routine and kind of find the motivation to do the assignments that I normally wouldn't have had trouble um, finding time to do and making um, part of my daily routine. So I think for me, the biggest challenge has been kind of finding that motivation that I never had trouble finding before for school. But I think my teachers have been really, really supportive and understanding. Um, that's something that's great about the Eastern professors they really understand that there are more things going on than what meets the eye. And there's more than just schoolwork that's going on in a student's life. And I'm definitely gonna carry that with me when I'm a teacher because that's so important. And it's been so helpful to me to be able to reach out to a teacher and say, okay, this is going on. I'm really struggling with anxiety regarding this. And they've been really understanding and that's been helpful because it has been hard some days to just get through the day. I mean, it's a changing world and it's been really hard, but those um, understanding, empathetic teachers have really made a difference. Yeah, There's I think being, being able to recognize that we're all in different, unique situations, yeah. um, you know, and we have to adapt. We have to be able to meet, meet the needs of our students where we're at and, and go with it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. All right, so um, uh, Kareen, um, so I know you being in the graduate program, you're already taking classes online. Was there, and Ben can talk to this too in a minute, um, but was there a transition or was it kind of like, did you notice anything actually changed? Has something changed? Yeah, so for, for me, the classes I was taking at Easter did not change at all because I was only taking um, online classes. But when I started my program, um, I thought the post-baccalaureate program was a combination of like classroom classes and online and was very sad <laughs> when I discovered it was 100% online because um, because I'm a real, I'm just an interactive kind of person. I like to be with other people. And um, so I had, I had made the adjustment to online learning um, by the time this all happened. But I definitely noticed that um, different there are different things that different teachers did in the online classes, like over the semesters that I've been taking classes, that some of them were really positive and some of them I, I thought I won't do that <laughs> when, I, when I'm leading that class. So I think um, like for, for me, the things that I found helpful um, were when the teachers did some kind of interaction. Like I had some classes where we never had a single Zoom session or video from the professor the whole time. So I just felt like, I mean, I could walk by the professor on campus and not even know it, you know? And so that just, it didn't, it didn't sit well with me. And so the professors that 
um, made videos and um, had on um, had live Zoom sessions. I really enjoyed that. So so that helped me figure out like what I needed to do with teaching my classes because I was teaching at the time this happened. I was learning a lot in Janine's class on how to teach math, science, <laughs> and health because I was teaching science for my first time ever. And um, but I also recognized the um, the emotional impact because I felt that myself just being on online classes and not being able to have the interaction in classes in general. So I was kind of sensitive to that for my kids. I appreciated Abby's point about being sensitive to the emotional um, impact because one of the things I did, one of the first things I did with my students when we went online was um, we were using Google Classroom, which I was not familiar with yet. And most of my students were somewhat familiar with it from other um, classes, but um, I needed to practice that. And so the first assignment I gave was just um, a Google form where I asked, what are you concerned about? How do you feel about what's happening? What prayer requests do you have? So I was able to like practice my own creation of a Google form and my own response to it and get important input and know like what was on the kids' minds and what they were concerned about. And um, so that was, I thought, a good way to, to start things out. Yeah, yeah. And Ben, how about for you? What was the, the transition like? Yeah, for, as far as the class goes, I was taking two online classes in the spring semester. So like class-wise, there wasn't a big transition, but like personally, it was absolute mayhem. <laughs> I work, uh, I obviously work remotely full-time now. My wife is working remotely full-time as well. And we have a three-year-old toddler that just demands constant attention, right? And we don't have family in the area to be able to, you know, quarantine pod with and kind of take, uh, take up the slack there. So our routine went from a pretty predictable nine to five routine to, okay, now you're 6 a.m. to midnight and figure out when you're going to get things done, right? So uh, the great thing, uh, the professors I had, Professor Dunn being one of them, um, like we're very understanding with just, you know, what everybody was dealing with personally. Um, and one thing I've said to a, a few people is, you know, we're all sitting here and nobody's life is better than it was a, a month ago, right? Like two months ago, right? Like, so I, I think that was the biggest thing, just getting that understanding from the faculty that we're all dealing with our unique challenges. And some, some challenges are, you, you know, some people might have situations that are more difficult than others. And, uh, you, you know, we're, we're all counting our blessings and seeing the silver linings. But still, you know, you know, everybody's transitioning and our, our, our professors were great at recognizing that. Yeah, and I think parents that are, ha have students that are, you know, school age, um, whether they're the younger ones, even preschool, right? That's a, <laughs> that's a whole, whole ball game in and of itself. But, um, you know, having to, they're working from home, they're trying to teach their own kids from home, they're dealing with children that, you know, are missing out on their, their high school graduation, or they've got college students that had to be, had to come home right away, and maybe their rooms weren't ready for them, or whatever it was. Um, Corrine, did you, do you have, um, you have, you have, you have children, right? Right, right. How's the so, transition been for them? So, my son is one of the unfortunate seniors. Um, oh. So, he, um, he was a senior at UMass, and they just graduated um, last Friday, and, and he was, he was devastated because, um, you know, their school first they announced we're going online after spring break for and they didn't know for how long. And then and then when, after half the kids had left for spring break, they said, guess what? We're not coming back at all. <laughs> and so um, so they had I mean, they had, you know, learning management system like Eastern has. They didn't use Brightspace, but they had you know something similar to that. So most of the kids there had some, even if they weren't taking online classes, they had some online aspects of their schoolwork that they're familiar with. But yeah, to, to Abby and Ben's point, it was like, it was just the personal and emotional impact um, more than anything, the technology you can learn. Most college students, you know, you have to have a laptop to be a college student nowadays. So, um, so they had the tech and they had the um, understanding for the most part. Um, but just when you're kind of in a bad place emotionally, forcing yourself to do your schoolwork when to Abby's point, you don't have a schedule or anything. It was, it was, yeah, it was a challenge. And um, um, so it was actually, it was good that most of the schools that it happened to, like it happened right at the time of spring break. So the kids had a week to kind of get used to the idea and mourn, you know, a little bit before they had to do um, their schoolwork. Um, but yeah, his, his biggest challenges were just, yeah, the kind of the inertia and emotional impact. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I can relate to as being a parent um, and an, and a teacher at the same time here where, you know, I have three children, one's in kindergarten, I got a fourth grader and I got a sixth grader uh, with some learning needs. And, you know, I'm, we're, we've been teaching online pretty much since, since within two days of closing down the school um, in person. And, you know, so I, my own kids, I feel like I, I haven't been paying them much attention because I'm trying to work at the same time and getting them online because they're doing online courses too. Um, but, you know, it's also made me realize that we're definitely not all in the same boat. Like everybody's experiencing these changes, the, the, this pandemic experience in and of itself, it's different for everybody, right? There, there's some parents that have been out of work for months now and they're worried about putting food on the table while there's others that have never worked more in their life, you know? And then I think of the students too, that some students are having really rich educational experiences, um, you know, while they're at home and, and, you know, things are still happening for them. And then there's other students where they're just not, there's nothing, nothing going on for them educationally. So if, any, if anything, I do think that the pandemic kind of has shown a spotlight on some equity issues that plague our educational system. But I do, however, think that there is a ray of hope here. Um, you know, educators now have an opportunity to really rethink teaching and learning. How can we rethink education as a whole? Um, how can school be done differently? And I think that Eastern is definitely on its way to proving that we can do school differently. Um, so that kind of leads me into our next, next section here where we wanted to talk about Eastern's impact um, and how Eastern has um, supported your experience in changing times and with uh, this change in education that's been happening here. Um, I would love to hear, you know, how, I guess just starting off, you know, maybe um, Brandon, like how did, um, how has Eastern kind of prepared you for these changing times? You know, is there, is there any way that Eastern has been able to support you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, when I graduated five years, nobody had an idea of what was coming with this. So education looked different at that point in time, five years ago, even. Uh, I would say the biggest thing that I walked away with as far as Eastern's direct impact is is the relationships that, that I've formed and, and created with certain professors, but also the understanding that as a teacher, uh, relationships and how far that can actually take you in the classroom. Um, you know, I can name like Dr. Chrisman, who I still have, you know, monthly phone calls with, who still works there all the time. That guy has completely changed my mind as far as worldview when it comes to education, just by interacting him. He was my my student teacher advisor. So I got to spend a lot of time with him and, and Harry Gatilius, who was we had in as in Saturn Charter School as a guest speaker. We formed and bonded over or these these experiences and I think ultimately when I take a look at virtual education it's going to be tough to to cultivate those new relationships especially considering students in the fall if we're virtual that you may or may not have had before so that's going to be a direct impact there but I think Eastern's built me to the point where I understand that as a as a teacher communication goes a long way so virtually can we communicate a little bit more precisely can we be a little bit more direct can we be a little bit more understanding and and in those relationships relationships understand that when a kid comes to, to class you have no idea what's going on in the back of their mind so understanding that Eastern has really developed that in me I think I have the ability I you know I almost can say it's emotional intelligence if you will and I, I do give a lot of credit to Eastern University and understanding that because of the people that that kind of led me through the program and, and the people that I still stay in contact with today so that's great Happy. Um, Let's hear from Abby if she has learned anything in her EDU yes. courses um, that you found useful. Yes, directly to Brandon's point, I definitely think I've taken away such incredible relationships from Eastern so far. And the relationships I've made with the professors, um, they've been, like I said, so understanding and empathetic. And that's kind of been instilled in my worldview going into teaching. Um, and so that's really important, especially now with these incredibly unprecedented times. But something else is that I think the socio-emotional aspect is something my professors have really focused on. And like Brandon said, you don't know what a kid is going through when usually when they uh, come through the door, but now when they get on Zoom and they, you don't know what's going on beyond the screen. And it's really, really important to consider that. Um, and it's gonna be really different. I'm supposed to be going into student teaching next year. I have no idea what that's gonna look like but Eastern has also instilled flexibility and adaptability in me. My professors are always saying, 
flexibility is the most important aspect of a teacher because things are just always changing. Even before now, it's just an ever-changing world of education. So I understand the importance of being flexible and creative and adaptable. And so that's a really important skill that Eastern's prepared me with. And I know I'm going to have to show those skills when I go into student teaching because I'm not even sure if it's going to be Zoom classes or if it's going to be face-to-face -face instruction. But whatever it is, I feel like I'm ready for it. I feel like Eastern has prepared me to uh, show that flexibility and adaptability. And I think to piggyback on what uh, Abby's talking about, I think central to my instruction at Eastern has been a real intentionality uh, to put process and skills over the content, um, to really think about teaching as designing learning experiences um, that I hope will spark an interest in you know, how we learn and how we teach and how we can find a new way forward in education. So it's almost become like a meme, right? Um, that you take a class or even a professional development session for those of you who are teachers out there uh, that's basically you know a lecture about cooperative learning um, right so i think i've tried to model an approach uh, to teaching and learning to see ourselves as scholar pr practitioners um, so janine and i this past semester for example launched an action research project in our class uh, to get at the heart of really how do you learn best and then how can we apply what we know to be true about learning? Um, what are the universal truths, right? Uh, to our own unit and lesson planning. So I really work um, to model and approach my own learning and teaching uh, so that we are really working to hone a craft, right? Uh, so if we understand that being a content master is just really the first step, that process, experience, relationship, all come before all of that. <coughs> Yep. <laughs> yeah, and, and and we learned a lot by, you know, we yep. we really consider our classrooms laboratories and that we encourage our students to think about that, that you're not just going in there and, you know, spewing knowledge to students, that this is, this is a collaboration, that you are working together um, to develop knowledge and to, to learn together. Um, but I could go off on that for a while. But I wanted to hear from um, Kareen and Ben, so about the impact that Eastern kind of has had on you. Um, Kareen, do you want to you want to start for us here? Sure, sure. Uh, so it's been phenomenal for me um, because I worked in the business world and operations management for literally decades, and I'm just switching to becoming a teacher now. And uh, so I just I had no idea. I had no idea like how much was involved in putting together lesson plans. Um, just all everything that goes on before you set foot in the classroom in order to be effective in the classroom and um, so just learned so much about that and um, also just in terms of being prepared for changing times a lot of the focus in the classes was on inclusion I mean so we had classes specifically about inclusive education but inclusion was an undercurrent of every single class we took and um, that's something I would have been utterly clueless about um, without these classes. And now, um, you know, I understand what it takes to do that and also what you're having to do to provide a, an inclusive environment really helps you to be able to adapt to whatever kind of changes might um, come your way because you've kind of built in the opportunity for different ways of learning and teaching um, in that. Um, also, just some of the things that I benefited from. So I was in a post-baccalaureate program. So these are all um, master's level classes. So a lot of the participants in the classes I was taking are experienced teachers who are going back for their master's, unlike me, who's just like starting fresh. So um, I got the benefit of the knowledge of all the other students because we would have discussion forums and we would have other assignments that we um, had to present to each other. And so I was able to learn from their experience teaching a variety of topics topics at all different age levels. And I found, you know, I learned, um, I learned, you know, almost as much from the other students as I did from the professors because of the experience that they brought. So those are all really, really positive aspects for me that I, I was just, I would just get so excited every week about what I was learning, the new things I was learning and how I'd be able to apply them. And that's a great point that collegiality b between educators is so important that in order to really, you know, 
increase your teaching practices, being the best teacher that you can possibly be means that you need to be able to communicate with other people. You need to be able to, you know, see what else is out there. What are other educators doing? We can learn from each other, right? Um, and that's, that's huge. Um, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. So Ben, I'm wondering how has Eastern impacted you? Yeah, I would go like beyond the curriculum and just say that I come from a very white educational experience. And it wasn't until I joined uh, the master's and uh, leadership program at Eastern that I felt like I was truly in a diverse environment. And with the background of education that I had prior, it was very much like achievement based, right? I was born into a family where going to college was the expectation. And when you have that, uh, you know, background, you're learning to achieve rather than learning to empower yourself. And going to school at Eastern and finally being able to interact uh, like with educational material in a diverse environment really showed me the point of what education really was, right? And how like me going through it for so long in an achievement-based manner really was cheapening that experience for myself. Uh, as opposed to, you, you know, learning that this knowledge, you know, is a lot of people's only hope to empower themselves to a better life. So, like, I would say just foundationally, the kind of place Eastern is, the fact that it's a Christian school that has such a diverse population, that's really impacted me more than anything. And it's really made me able to collaborate with others, um, really able to empathize with others better, and really made me more equipped to just, you know, be a good citizen. And I think that's one of the biggest parts about, you know, being a, a mentor and a role model and an educator is just, can you be somebody that's relatable to others? Can you be somebody that, you know, can empathize with other people in their experience and their hardships? And I think Eastern's prepared me for that in a way no other place could. Well, speaking of relating to others, um, I will never forget your your lesson that you did. So all my students have to do have to record lessons, and um, <laughs> Ben, you had a great one where you incorporated some some stories. You got rappers in there, and <laughs> you were just I could totally picture you know you were you were going for a certain audience, and I loved it. It was great, yeah. <laughs> so I, I could see where where you're going with that. Um, so I wanted to transition to kind of talking about like the different skill sets that teachers really need. And I, I think that Ben brought up a great point with, uh, you know, just being able to, to relate, right, to, to your students. But you know, like what other kind of skill sets are teachers going to need, um, you know, in these changing times? I think that access to technology um, and being able to learning how to use that technology is certainly important right now um, if you're able to access it. Um, you know, Eastern has definitely been making sure that it can provide future teachers with experiences using 21st century tech tools like smart boards. Uh, we have iPads, we have the video recording room in the library. Um, but definitely time changes everything though, right? And our skills um, needed for teaching today are certainly different than what they were 10 years ago, and they will continue to change as time moves on. I know Julie and I, we've talked a lot about this um, since we're directly preparing students to go out and teach in this changing world. What would you say are some of the skill sets that teachers need to have today? Well, I think it goes back to what I was saying before about how I approach um, my work as an instructor, but also as a teacher in my seventh and eighth grade classroom, um, where we, if we think about um, our classroom as a laboratory, um, that we put process and skills over the content um, that being a content master is just not enough. Um, I think um, there could be, a, you know, there is a nod to the standards, but it's the student learning and experiences that really should be driving the curriculum. Um, and that's really what um, I think can set a program apart at this time. Uh, so when I see, you know, on the news, you know, there's been like the packet pickups um, on the street corners or whatever. Um, and, I, and I know this is emergency school. Um, but that is a window into what school must have been like um, two months ago, you know, that there's a packet pickup. Uh, so how can we move and adapt um, and move beyond the packet work? Um, and maybe not right now. This is emergency school. Um, we didn't have time to whip up a whole cyber school experience for our students. Uh, definitely every day we do this, we get better. Um, but if, if learning is experience, then how can we hold on to that in this virtual um, time that we're having, um, no matter what it looks like uh, next year. 
So um, I wonder, Brandon, uh, what do you think um, are the skills necessary for trying to pull this off in uh, today's world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is a topic, a, a pretty broad topic we could spend a, a lot of time, probably another separate webinar on. Um, <laughs> but some of the most important ones, obviously the ones that stick out like crazy are tech savvy, the ability to access Zoom, use it in different ways, uh, things like that. Also, at the same point, the ability to use other tech tools, um, whether it's a Google Classroom platform, Schoology, other things like that we'll talk about. Um, but ultimately, I think a big thing for this virtual setting, the virtual classroom, if you will, is, is communication. It's going to be uh, the ability for the teacher to be upfront, be very honest, realize that there's really good days, there's really positive days, and then it's okay to have really bad days and it's okay to be, you know, down on things. And it's okay to understand that, that this is not normal. This is not what we want. Um, but understanding that as a teacher, being very, very flexible, uh, you know, every single day, something new is going to come your way. End of March, here comes something completely new that none of us had put in our job descriptions, but now we absolutely can, right? The ability to teach from home. Um, and then the biggest thing too, as I've started, you know, pretty early in my career, I've been teaching for five years now, the biggest thing that, you know, as I walk away or I take a look at it, the ability to wear multiple hats. Every day you kind of go into school, you, you have your role as, as a teacher, you're teaching certain subjects, teaching certain curriculum items, but ultimately, that day you may need to be an encouragement type person for somebody for an individual whether it's a student or a or a co-worker or you know me being a male i tend to move around kind of talk to different kids throughout because there's not a ton of males especially in the middle level education system right now and you know i would find my way down to I spent some time in kindergarten, got some snot on my, my pants because I'm a little too tall. You know, it's just the ability, the, the ability to be fluid in your practice and, and understanding that each day is going to demand something different of you. And that's okay. And that's actually good because that's going to push you out of your comfort zone, allowing yourself to take, take risks every single day. And especially in virtual feeling, it's okay to take risks. It's okay to fail once in a while. It's, it's absolutely okay. And I think the ultimately, the last thing I would say is just, you know, don't be so hard on ourselves as educators. We're not perfect human beings. We're never gonna be perfect. Our students aren't gonna be perfect. If we can reach one kid a day, then I think we can go home being pretty satisfied at that point and understanding, you know, each day is a new slate. As a middle level educator, all Janine and this was one of the first things they taught me when I was coming to the pipeline. Like, you better wipe it clean because the same kid's going to drive you insane tomorrow and he's going to ruin your day. Just let it go. So things like that, the, the awareness, I guess, as a, as a social person, as well as a, in your practice, the awareness of students and, and colleagues is, is going to be massively, massively important. So I like how you mentioned, um, you know, taking risks and, you know, being willing to recognize that you're going to make mistakes, that sometimes things don't go, the best laid plans sometimes don't work out. Um, Kareen, I'm, I wonder if you've had some experience with that now that you've, uh, you, you just recently started teaching. Um, what kind of skills do you think that, you know, you're, you're looking forward to developing here? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, Brandon really covered the main things that, um, that I was um, thinking of also, but um, just to add thoughts about a couple of them. I, I, I have found versatility is really important in patients. Um, and well, you're talking risk taking that sometimes you have a whole plan for how things are going to work and they just don't work that way. <laughs> and so, so you, got, you pretty much got to have a plan B and you have to be um, okay with going with the flow um, when things um, don't quite go as expected. But um, one thing also is that there's just, there's no substitute for for personal connection and communication. So, so even if your classes are forced to be online, like we've all um, experienced, um, you know, if you have that personal relationship ahead of time before that happens, that's definitely a big um, plus because you can kind of build on that. But to establish a personal relationship kind of from scratch without ever interacting with the kids first is a real is a real big challenge. But I think it's important, you know, for example, when we're having when we're having um, the live Zoom sessions I would have with my class. Um, you need to be looking at all the kids on their cameras, just like you would look at them in the classroom and see what do they look like today? You know, if someone is in their pajamas and looks like they just rolled out of bed, they probably did. And that may not be a problem once, but if it's like that every day you see them, then maybe there's something going on. So I think we have to be, um, yeah, looking for clues to, um, to, to, 
that would tell us that the kids are having issues or concerns. And um, I found I had to be, um, I had to get parents involved a lot sooner when the kids um, weren't getting homework done um, because the parents were having a really hard time helping their kids because of what we talked about um, before. And you know, they just didn't know how to help. And so um, instead of like having a couple conversations with a student before the parents get involved, boom, right out of the gate, the parents are getting in involved to see if we can work together to help the kids. Um, so, so yeah, they just got to make sure that you're, that you're stepping up the communication in maybe new and different ways than you otherwise would have. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think, Corrine, you, you bring us back to, um, you know, families have always played a really large role. Um, and that window has just gotten a little larger for teachers. Um, first of all, for families to have a window into what we're trying to do, um, even though this is sort of topsy-turvy. Um, but now we have a window into the, the family and the family supports that, that students have, you know, or don't have. Um, and I think bringing it, it around to relationships, um, if we're thinking about, you know, equity, um, that's really been laid bare as well. I think we can all agree that um, there's a lot you can mitigate in a, in a school situation um, that you can account for, that you can make okay, <laughs> um, or not be the great equalizer. That was never going to happen, um, but certainly that you have you know, a face-to-face -face relationship with, with that child. And certainly that relationship is, is stressed or changed, right? Um, so I think going back to being a culturally responsive educator is going to take some reflection. Um, you know, what's important? I think that's really been the key question. Um, so right away, um, the first thing to go was the state testing. Um, the second thing to go, what was it? You know, and what are we keeping? What are we holding on to? And I think that has been like the really driving thing in this whole um, coronavirus landscape. Um, what do we hold on to? What's essential learning? Um, so getting down to those kind of questions, it's been an interesting conversation to be part of across the country, um, for sure. Yeah. Ben, you got any final thoughts here on uh, skills that teachers might need? Uh, one thing that's really been helpful to me is I've been very, like, I, I've been fortunate that my team is very proactive in being, you know, having a good plan. And that's really allowed us to just anticipate everything that could go wrong. Because when all this stuff was unwinding, it was just like one gut shot after another, just like, this goes wrong, this goes wrong, this goes wrong. And we were able to anticipate a lot of the things that were going to happen because we were really confident with our plan A. And being prepared in our plan A really let us anticipate, all right, what happens when we got to go to plan B? What's, what's next? So uh, I think just preparation and collaboration were, you know, the big keys for us. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, why don't we move on to talking about some helpful tech tools here. I'm aware that we're running, starting to run short on time. Um, so we mentioned earlier that definitely, you know, being able to navigate technology um, is a skill necessary for teachers now. Um, and currently there is a flood of online resources being offered to teachers for free nonetheless. And it can be really overwhelming to look through so many offers and try to find the time to test them out before you launch them with your students. Um, but listed on this slide are some of our top suggestions for tech tools that can support online teaching and learning. Um, and I'll, I'll gladly summarize a few of them in, in a little bit if we have a little extra time here. Um, but right now I first wanna just take a moment, I was hoping that we could maybe take a moment to share some tips for teaching and learning online for teachers, students, and even parents. And I'm, I'm wondering what sort of technology tools are like the must haves. Um, and uh, Julie, maybe you can start us off with just some, some teaching tips for online. Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that it says tech tools, I think for a reason, like I would be very cautious about adopting any programmatic, um, you know, wholesale, just adopting it and then calling that, you know, a day, you know, so it should not be central, but it's a tool. Um, and really thinking about, you know, online learning is not the same. So trying to replicate that unit that you were, you know, maybe you're desperately trying to hold on to uh, your plans from early March, um, it probably isn't working out so well. So there has to be a different approach, right? Um, but I think that if we go to what I was saying before, trying to figure out what is essential, learning can be fun. It can be actually more individualized. 
Um, we are definitely a Google Classroom platform school. Um, we have utilized a lot of these different uh, tools that you see here, including HyperDocs um, and ReadWorks and um, the TED Ed Talks and things like that. Um, and we're definitely all on Zoom. Again, luckily for us, we did have some experience before the, the closure. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, navigating in Zoom. Here we are on a Zoom webinar, um, which I've never experienced before. So this is a cool tool that I've learned tonight. Um, but Zoom, you know, has breakout rooms. Um, Zoom, um, we can have individual conferences throughout our day. Um, I know at Satterton Charter School uh, Collaborative, what we've done is gone for Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and in the mornings in our middle school program, we have live classes, and then in the afternoons, we have small group sessions or individual sessions with students who may be falling out and need that more personalized, you know, instruction. Um, we also are, are meeting with kids to make sure that, you know, reading conferences and just conversations are still happening. Um, we have utilized breakout rooms um, to have kids still have that social connection with school. Um, so it's middle school. It's like drinking water. They need to socialize, right? Um, so that's some of the ways that we've tried to. We have Wide Open School, which is a great uh, source that we've used to take some virtual field trips and things like that. Um, so we've incorporated a lot of voice and choice. Uh, we've tried to hold on to the project-based approach um, that we had before. Um, that's met with some challenges, um, but certainly, um, you know, I think, again, we're getting better at it every day. So Brandon, uh, do you have anything to add about tech suggestions? Yeah, I mean, you guys kind of summarize what we're doing from our front. Uh, as far as tech goes, I think, you know, obviously with us being virtually now, everything's going to be tech based, but I think at some point too, like we have to find some form of a balance. So whether that's bringing in some fun, or, fun activities that, you know, get the kids up and about, uh, allowing the kids some type of, you know, diversity as far as how they're going to learn, whether it's through videos, whether it's through you kind of chatting with them, you know, verbal uh, conversation, or if it's you sharing a screen and kind of going over things. I think the ability for us to, to change things, change format is going to play a large role um, as you go week to week because you know I think zoom zoom itself can get stale uh, I think us teachers have felt that where there's long weeks and you're like man I can't spend another half hour just sitting on zoom chatting imagine what a middle school or a younger kid or even older kids are feeling too as they're kind of taking a, a step back and saying wow this is you know, can be overwhelming at times but I think ultimately, like if I want to highlight one, I would say a HyperDoc. I just created a HyperDoc for, for our physics unit. Um, again, curriculum wise, we don't have a book, we don't have a textbook, we don't have things like we're just copying and pasting and putting it in. Uh, what I did is I spent a couple hours, and I'm not going to tell you the honest amount of hours I spent doing that because it's a little too much. Um, but I was able to kind of comb through a bunch of tech sites. I used Wide Open School where they have like virtual roller coasters, like Disneyland is all virtual right now. You can hop on roller coasters, you can understand some physics based on that. I was able to pull a bunch of different websites, a bunch of videos from YouTube, a bunch of, you know, different articles, all different types of formats and, and kind of throw that in almost front load it with the kids and then allow them the student choice, allow them the choice to kind of go through it at their own pace to kind of understand things on their own. And then also at the same time, allow myself to have office hours. Okay? So office hours, they're able to come in, chat with me. Are you, do you need help? Do you have a question? What, what's going on here? And then also that, that gives me the, that personal relationship back a little bit where I can kind of see like, is a kid falling out? Here, here's why type of thing. And it's all right there on one doc. So the HyperDocs, you know, it, it's been huge. It's, it's been a huge success for us. Julie did some as well for ELA and, and uh, history related stuff. So we have a bunch of different things kind of moving. Uh, the last thing is, you know, it might not be on the list, but it's Kahoot. Uh, we use some cahoots here and there just to kind of spice it up. Again, it gets stale, gives the kid a chance to, to kind of, you know, be interactive with his peers, his, his or her peers, and, and be interactive with the teacher. So, Yeah, and if anybody that's interested in HyperDocs, you can just go to hyperdocs.co, and there's they have templates for you, and they have video tutorials on how to make them. They're a great online online tool. Abby, I wonder if you have any tech suggestions for how maybe learning has been made easier or something um, in your planning. Or how's yeah. Zoom? 
Um, I actually love HyperDocs. I recently created a unit and because of the classes I've taken with Janine, I was equipped to create one. And I think they're awesome because they allow you to differentiate the tech tools that you are using and you can incorporate so many different things. Um, like Brennan said, videos, um, articles, games, whatever it might be, they're so interactive. And I had never heard of them before I came to Eastern. So I really do love those. Um, and I've been able to include those in my unit plans. I've had so many unit plans due at the end of the semester last week. But some of the things my teachers have used um, after we went online, definitely there was a lot of videos that can be good and bad. I think it's definitely important for teachers to differentiate which tools from technology that they're using. Videos can get boring, but they can also offer some great supplemental learning. Um, and then I also had teachers offering articles from various places. I have learned recently about, um, what, Janine, what's the website you taught us? Wonderopolis. Wonderopolis uh, was such one of those great ones that I've been able to include in my units as well. But I've had my teachers show lots of articles and give us choices about what to read. And I had recently in EDUC 385, I had my professor give us an article about what learning looks like for students with EBD right now online. And I was really intrigued by that. And I found myself reading up on that. And so I think it's important that we're staying current with the articles and with what we're reading. Um, and technology can really help us do that. And I like how you added that, you know, especially when we use Google Classroom, you know, we can really differentiate. Not every student has to be reading the same article at the same reading level. So different ways and, and allowing students to choose um, from menu items and things like that has been um, really helpful for us this, this semester. All right, Corrine, what's your, uh, your one tech tool that you think is a, a must have? Okay, I love Edpuzzle. <laughs> it's my favorite. That is my go-to. So, um, so the school I was teaching at, we used, um, we didn't, uh, didn't, hadn't standardized on Google Classroom before we went to distance learning, but we basically did after that. And um, that was an awesome tool. And, and Edpuzzle is um, integrated with Google Classroom. So if you're using Google Classroom, um, you can issue assignments through Google Classroom and, and, and have kids click right within that into the Edpuzzle. And you can, Edpuzzle can take a video from any, any website on the planet, basically. Um, and you can customize that video and insert questions at any point then have the students have to answer the question before they can continue and then because it's integrated with google classroom you can grade it through google classroom and um and i would give my students an ed puzzle video normally at least uh, normally every week they would get one they would get a video of me <laughs> done teaching they'd get an ed puzzle 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 video and they might get other ones as well. But I got a lot of good feedback from my students. I got, you know, I would have them, um, the, the, either the first or second ed puzzle assignment we did, the final question I had at the end of it was, what do you think of this? And so students were saying, this was so cool and this was fun. And so they were, and it was, it was really great because they have to pay attention because they know a question's coming, but they don't know what the question is. And, um, and, but then it stops and makes them think about it. So if you just watch a video, you can zone out, you know, and even if you're trying to pay attention, it can be difficult. But if you've got, if you've got it stopping and asking you questions as you go along, you're, it's helping you to actually pay attention and glean something from it. And it's a lot more fun. Yeah. 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 Ed Puzzle is a good one. All right, Ben, bring it home here for us. What's your one uh, tech tool suggestion? I, I uh, was blown away, Professor Dunn, that you just had me take a class where I did not have to buy a textbook. <laughs> and I was so unbelievably grateful for that. And it was so productive to every week have like a current, like up to date handpicked curriculum that I could engage with. Um, and it wasn't just like, hey, caveman, open and read this book, right? It was like interactive. And I found myself so many, uh, so many lessons just going down the rabbit hole on something I found that you had pointed out to me where I was just like, Oh, I got to learn more about this. So that's like, I'm sure it would have been super easy for you to just pick a book and give it to us and say, Hey, read chapter five. Um, but I really appreciated how thorough you were with the resources you selected for us to learn with and saw how like, you know, that could really impact learning, like not just reading the same old book over and over again, but just having different things to, you know, use using that as resources instead of just touches. Right. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of open education resources, OER. So um, I don't, I agree with Julie, she had mentioned it earlier, but you know, don't, it, don't, don't get stuck by and you're buying into one program and that's like a macro level sort of thing. And then you, and that makes it hard to differentiate for kids. Um, so yeah. Well, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we had a little bit of time to ask, answer a few questions that maybe have come in here. Um, I could go on forever about like other ways to incorporate technology and, you know, project based learning into online learning, but we're out of time. I guess we're gonna have to have another webinar. I don't know. <laughs> All right, Rebecca, what kind of questions do you have for us? Yeah, just a few came in and I just wanted to make sure that we were able to touch on them. So one of our attendees did ask that she's mostly interested in adult education. So were there any specific tips or tools on energizing the Zoom classroom for learning and dialogue for adults? In Zoom, I think, I think going back to the relationship piece there, if you're using Zoom, um, definitely the breakout rooms for doing group work and collaboration and holding these discussions. Um, there's so many different things that you can do with the breakout rooms. That would be my one, my one tip for using that. Um, Kareen, you got a suggestion? Yeah, just a couple of things. Use your um, participants panel because there's fun little emojis that you can use for interacting with people. So that's fun. And then also games. You can play online games in Zoom and, and they're just fun. And so adults like games probably more than kids do even. <laughs> so if you want to, if you want to keep them engaged, there's a lot of educational games you can pull in. Yeah, it breaks the ice. Um, Julie, did you have any suggestions? Yeah, I think the, the breakout rooms are, are really important just to keep that social aspect. And, you know, I think there's a balance that adult learners have to strike between, um, you know, having it, you know, asynchronous and then coming together live. Uh, so it depends on the course that you're offering for, for college students. But I know for, for me, I always, every week, you know, offered, um, if, it, if it weren't asynchronous class, offered that time to come together live. And for, for, some, for me, someone who's done a lot of adult education classes, uh, just having a different format to like express my work in, um, like Professor Dunn had me do a, a, like videos frequently and those were great. It was such a break to, hey, instead of writing this paper, just shoot a three minute video of yourself talking about this topic and that, that was really helpful. Yeah. Great. And I think that leads into kind of the next question on any suggestions on making student presentations work in the online setting. <laughs> well, we're, we're actually about to, I'll jump in with um, our student activism project work. So right when we were about to leave um, in our seventh and eighth grade uh, classroom, we had um, kids were working on student activism in the community. Um, so the students researched community issues and brainstormed ideas. And then we ended up actually still sharing those with the stakeholders. Uh, so they had um, a recorded Zoom session, and then we had, you know, feedback. Um, I think with more time, I could have made that better, but uh, definitely those kind of presentations that were real and authentic um, can still happen. Um, I think we also have something called iSearch in our school, where uh, kids spend one year um, focusing on one uh, topic of their choosing. Um, and we are going to invite the entire school community for their presentation. Um, so those presentations will look like a, a, a Google slideshow that they will have. Uh, they will share their field work and their interview that they completed over the, the course of the year. And then they will also um, teach. Uh, so our students will be teaching um, some part of their time um, in their seventh and eighth graders. So I think definitely it can be done. Yeah, and there's all sorts of other platforms out there too, aside from, from Zoom. I know Prezi now does, you can do video presentations in Prezi, which are, are pretty cool. Um, you, can, you can use re different recording options, whether it's on Zoom or your computer, but, you know, and then be able to create YouTube video, you know, upload them to YouTube and be able to share presentations that way. Um, so yeah, kind of making them like TED Talks and giving them like, all right, you have 15 minutes to talk about this topic and, you know, ready, set, go. <laughs> We've yeah, had kids this period do podcasting too. That was fun. Yeah. I think something else that goes along those lines is understanding that this is going to be a new type of format for presentation for the kids. Um, almost go over the little itty bitty things, the little itty bitty details. Like for example, today we talked about, you know, how do you present online? 
is half of your face covered? Are, are we not able to hear you? Are you not sitting close enough to your computer? Understanding that the kids probably don't under like realize actually what they're doing online at times and understanding that you're probably going to have to reteach some of those skills that they already had in the classroom, but now you got to actually do it online. So that's another kind of aspect. Give them the, the tools that they're going to need in order to find success. So. And I know we've had many lessons with our, our younger students, you know, how, how to do that. So a, an English language arts class might look like, what is, what is a podcast and how can I create one? And, and some of that is teaching the technology. Um, so that's all interwoven as, as well. Great, and I think we have time for one more question. Actually, two questions came in along the same vibe, pretty much asking, you know, how is your school and how are we supporting you know families and students that don't have like the resources to complete their schoolwork both monetary tech and also attention you know how do you support the children that are at home and they have single parents that really aren't having time to focus on homeschooling giving that support during this time yeah, it's tough. And I think every school right now is trying to make those sort of decisions with like, how do they meet those students um, where they're at? And, you know, you can't, you can't change the situations that, you know, certain families have found themselves in, but what can we do to support them? Um, you know, like our school, we definitely have any student that didn't, we, we took a survey, any student that didn't have computers at home or have access, we made sure that we, we got it to them. Um, so they were, they were able to join in classroom sessions. We've made sure that we are accessible, um, that students are able to come to office hours with us, um, that we're able to work with students, you know, in, small, in a smaller group setting, even if it is online. Um, you know, if they need us to call them, we're calling them. <laughs> you know? um, I, I think our motto, it's whatever it takes, you know, to, to get them on board and make sure that they are still learning right and that they're making progress worked harder <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah i don't think i've ever worked more in my life but it's very challenging. Um, yeah it's it's challenging and i'm not sure that there is just like an answer for that because it's going to be so dependent upon where your school is located and the resources that you have i mean i am well aware of you know the struggles that a lot of the city schools are having right now you know they had to quickly apply for all these grants so that they could get technology out to their students. But then that you get it, get the technology out to them, they haven't had any training on them or used them before. And the same thing with their teaching staff. So now you, you fixed one problem, but you just created a whole nother one, <laughs> you know? Um, so I don't know, that's, that's, a hard, that's a tough question to answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem, and I think, uh oh, let's see here. Um, all right, so I think, we hit the, uh, the end of our webinar. Thank you all for uh, joining us. I put up a slide, so we have the uh, contact information. So Janine, did you want to expound on this slide a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And I, I saw some familiar names in the participants. So hi, friends. <laughs> it's good to see you here. And former students, it's so great. Um, you know, again, I go back to this idea of the relationships, right, that Eastern University is able to provide us with, with a network that we can connect with. And I hope that everybody will utilize the alumni network here. Um, you know, reach out, reach out to, to Julie and I. Um, we, we're available. Um, we don't mind answering questions. You're welcome to come and visit our school. Um, come to an online session. <laughs> um, and then if you're interested in learning more, you know, talking, talking more about, you know, being able to rethink education and how school can be done differently, we encourage you to check out our podcast. The link um, is at the bottom there. It's called Rethinking EDU. Um, and Julie and I, with a couple of our other educator friends, just like to talk about issues in education and where things are going and how we're going to do school differently. <laughs> so thanks again, everyone, for coming. And uh, it's, been, it's been a great discussion. I'd like to really thank my panelists for, for joining us, too. So round of applause. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank, thank you. you. And I just want to give a little round out for ways to support teaching and learning at Eastern. We do have the uh, kind of new fund in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So if anyone feels the need and can give what they can, we are better together. So the link is there. Um, and this will support Eastern, the community, the students through scholarships and the help that they need. Um, and also just our quick little plug, 
we are coming up with more and more events online and trying to keep everyone engaged and connected with Eastern during this time. So there's all our wonderful social media handles. So choose the ones that you use the most. And like I said, this has been recorded. It'll be uploaded on YouTube and sent out to everyone. And any further ideas or comments, feel free to reach out to Janine and Julie. And you can also email us at alumni at eastern.edu. But you no, know, we did pretty good with time with so much uh, <laughs> things to discuss. And I think we might need another one. So thank you all again and have a wonderful Monday evening and a wonderful week. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.